like, if you want to know about climate change, ask the Pentagon. Like, if I would have came to this meeting and did a Google on Cindy Sheehan and what she had to say about the Pentagon, I would be able to express it more clearly. But I know that that information is out there. And so, because this is very demoralized, and so we have to find a way to counter this demoralization and fight back and incorporate hope in our life, you know, while all this is going on, because I don't doubt for a minute that the Pentagon would send missiles into the ocean, destroy some plate in Latin America, create earthquakes and stuff like that. But most people don't think like me. But honestly, I don't doubt for a minute that they would do something like that. So that's why I want to bring it to the subject. And what, what do you? So, so I'll, 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 I'll jump in. Um, I think that. So I mean, so one aspect, of, I mean, I'll say that, and this is kind of unrelated to this, I think, on the panel, but climate change uh, is something that I think the US government and most governments look at as a national security issue. And so I think that there is something in terms of, I mean, you know, if, if droughts become more common or if where hurricanes go are changing, you know, that impacts social, political interactions everywhere. And I think we've started to see examples of that. And if we have a nice free Arctic in the future, then that's going to change, I think, a lot of things. Um, and so to some extent, I, will, I, I, would, I would say that, without getting myself down a road that I want to go down to, is that the US government is interested in climate change from multiple levels because, because of national security issues. When it gets to, um, I think, using the weapons that are out there to potentially change direction of hurricanes, to change ocean circulation, um, I would say that it's very unlikely that the, any government would do that, in part because, uh, if anything, we've been engineering the Earth's atmosphere for 100 plus years in ways that we didn't understand. Uh, and I think that we don't actually have the ability um, to, to do any of that reliably uh, and without potential ramifications for everyone on Earth. And so I, I would assume that there's at that type of that level of, of using, I guess, science to kind of engineer science is something that um, that would be very unlikely, at least in the near future. I think the gentleman next to you, Chris, had a question, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to bring up uh, uh, when Hurricane Sandy uh, hit New York area, um, the uh, NOAA uh, provided funding to do some uh, research, so social science research, and uh, New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey Sea Grant uh, um, managed those uh, funds, and, uh, and that was part of the Coastal Storm Awareness Program, and uh, provided a lot of research on social science of how uh, people responded to the warnings and how they responded to uh, messages about storm surge and um, and about how they uh, reacted to you know why why they um, evacuated or didn't evacuate why they stayed or didn't stay and there was a lot of information that uh, that came out of that uh, um, uh, there's a lot of barriers to people moving because they don't have cars they don't have means of transportation. Uh, they're elderly or, or they have, uh, you know, um, mobility issues. A lot of the uh, shelters don't have uh, access for uh, people in wheelchairs or crutches or something like that. People concerned about pets. People are bedridden and, and that kind of stuff. And then there's a lot of concern, of uh, confusion about terminology. There is information about confusion about mandatory versus uh, voluntary. And there's information about who the sources of information that are trusted, which is was found that local uh, news weather anchor, weather meteorologists are the most trusted, followed by the National Weather Service. And um, and part of the results of that research was information on the graphics used. And actually, because of the results of some of that research, the National Weather Service service changed their graphics to be uh, more user friendly so that citizens would understand. And that's been like an ongoing um, back and forth between the researchers, Sea Grant, and the National Weather Service. 
to update their graphics so that they're more um, understandable to the public. And also, as mentioned uh, by one of the panelists, people are interested in their local uh, environment. What's going to happen on my street or my neighborhood? And, part, and, if, you, and you, if you watch the uh, Weather Channel, they've adapted some of that. They have some of this uh, virtual reality showing a, a street scene and like, yeah. this is what uh, eight foot storm surge looks like, you know, and they show a car getting very, and it helps people to visualize, oh, well, what, that, what that means. And so that, that um, collection of research, which was from 2014, had a lot of useful social science. Um, I had a quick question though. Um, is artificial intelligence used in forecasting in, in your in your work? Mm -hmm. Does that play a role? Um, I was just gonna say that there is a lot of development. Yeah, there's a huge push from NOAA right now to bring in artificial intelligence. It's a big part of their strategic plan over the next few years. Um, back last week, I think they released a draft of their AI strategy moving forward. Um, there's been directives from the president that we maintain leadership in AI. Um, in terms of what's currently there, I don't think we quite have anything operationally uh, that's using artificial intelligence. There's a lot of developments happening. Um, I know we experimented with um, a neural network for intensification this year for hurricanes. Um, it's going to require a lot more work to get it to where it can be operationally used. Um, but also data assimilation wise, I think artificial intelligence will a um, big role in bringing some of those observations, assimilating them into the models. Um, they can be computationally, uh, save costs computationally in time uh, that we need to get them in in time. So I think there's a lot of movement in that direction, and I, I, am, I think there's going to be a huge push in the next decade to bring more of that into the forecasting realm. And I'll say that it's not being, I think it, it is being used in other weather applications that in our department, we had a seminar yesterday from someone who works at the Weather Prediction Center um, that it is being, AI is being used, machine learning is being used in prediction of um, flooding rains, so just non-hurricane flooding rains over the U.S. Um, there's a product developed at Colorado State University that's actually being used, so I think in, in hurricanes, um, in some of my work, we've used it to look at patterns of flow around storms to predict what they're going to do. Um, I'm actually using a neural network to do some work looking at um, to try to pick out which storms are going to go undergo rapid intensification. So I think there's a huge push in a lot of areas where it's, it's being used. And I think that's one um, area where there's going to be a lot of growth in the next five to 10 years. And from a computer model perspective, um, you, I mentioned the teeny tiny processes that happen very fast and that we don't know a lot about. And at NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, there are people whose titles are specifically machine learning scientists who are working on developing like um, algorithms using AI, machine learning, deep learning to like to the to predict those processes and be integrated into the model. And the advantage being that they are a lot, a lot faster than what a computer model could do. So that's another application as well. Not necessarily replacing the whole computer model, right. but like supporting the computer model where it's deficient. It's very interesting. All right, I'm going to Chris set his hand up next. So. so a quick question. Obviously, we care about impacts and hazards. Are there any in situ observations, for example, in Puerto Rico that could be added that will increase resiliency for um, hazard forecasting or impact forecasting? Am I so <laughs> So um, I'll briefly mention um, that um, one big issue when Maria made love call was that the whole observational network collapsed. To this day, I mean, we have an observational 40 inches of rain, but that's before the station flooded. So we don't know if it rained even more than that. Um, there, I understand that there are like some small networks of private uh, wind observations, but all of them also collapsed during hurricanes, so it was very, very hard for the forecasters to know actually like which towns were um, being affected by how strong of a wind because the radar also was blown away. So yeah, I, I mess on that on steroids. <laughs> 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 the can't withstand uh, hurricane force winds. I think. I 
think so, it's also um, at a forum that I was a year ago with Kurt and forecasters, they mentioned that not just for Puerto Rico, but in general, they don't have a lot of information once the hurricane makes landfall. So like Ken Rick was saying, maybe you have some rainfall coming behind the storm or some strong winds and the observational network collapses. And I think it's a big, big challenge um, overall. You guys at NOAA and the media have got to be the two experts on figuring out when, uh, weather over the, the oceans. And both do a great job. And when you put those models up there, there's two different models. One that you guys do and one that the Navy does. What's, what's the difference in how come there isn't one combined, one from the two of you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Models are very different. They are called the Navy model or the NOAA or the European model because those are the agencies right. that contain that. But they are, in essence, they are very different in the numerics. They are very different in many aspects. Uh, NOAA is moving towards a unified system, so just one model to predict everything from tornadoes to rain to hurricanes. But um, yeah, I don't. I don't know if it's possible to just combine everything we have out there into one model because like, each center has their own stakeholders and their own needs and so they also have their own science behind the models. Uh, and Navy models also have technical uses. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I would just say that it's, it's probably even there's even more models from the climate side. So from climate modeling, uh, I mean, there's probably, I don't know the number, but there's probably at least a half dozen, if not more, that are developed within the United States alone. Um, and I think, you know, part of that is, it's for the same reason, it comes out of applications. So like the Department of en Ener Energy, for example, actually has their own climate model, and that's in part because they're interested in knowing where water's gonna be in the future, because every source of energy, besides solar and, and wind, depends upon water. Uh, where the applications for NOAA might be different and trying to understand how weather changes specifically or something like that. Um, so I think there, there's, there is use in having multiple models because science is based upon the reproducing of others' results and, and by developing having multiple models uh, allows you to make more robust conclusions if those models are developedly, developed separately and not the, the, the there is always a little bit of overlap in which you know some you know some aspect of a model has made it into another one, and that's because maybe it's shown to be a superior way to, to represent this process, for example, in the atmosphere. Um, but I, I think that that the reasons are probably go back from historical reasons in which why and why so many different models exist. But I also think from a scientist's perspective that there's an advantage to having multiple models because it allows for for kind of the real scientific method to work itself out. Not to forget that the atmosphere is very chaotic, so one single model cannot perfectly tell us what's going to happen. Yeah, all I do is for asthma, I do distortion modeling, I know. <laughs> and some people, you know, they do, they do see the clouds, they put seeds in the clouds, you know, because I read this, you know, I read this in an article, in several articles that, you know, people can put seeds in the clouds to create more rainfall, to create suffering for people and stuff. So it's not like, you know, and they use the weather models to actually determine where the seeding will take place. And then sometimes when I look up in the sky, it seems like there's like a crisscross, and it just seems so odd and unusual the way it is, you know, I'm thinking, what are they doing now? Like um, from a climate science point of view, uh, uh, is there a sense that uh, there's greater accuracy that we're looking at, at the uh, uh, signals and precipitations, say, tropical cyclones uh, from, from climate change, from the uh, counterfactual or the modeling approach versus the statistical approach? I mean, is it even, uh, 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 because we have sensitive ones, even more accurate than the other? 
So I don't know, I mean, I, I can't talk to whether one's more accurate than the other. When you're using a modeling approach, right, you're, you're actually, it's an estimate. So, I mean, you're, you're never representing reality exactly, and that's, I mean, that's the, the basis of kind of numerical modeling. But the, the advantage of numerical modeling is, is it, it, so there's, when you look at, you know, trends in precipitation changes, you should never rely on, on one technique, right? And so the, the, the nice thing about the, what modeling offers is if you've used, if you look at your observations and you've done statistical techniques to do this, which, for example, I, I'll use the example of, of Hurricane Harvey, because when people have looked at precipitation associated with that, there's been a variety of techniques in which they've all come to essentially the same conclusion, in which there's been some increase in the precipitation associated with Hurricane Harvey on the order of 7 to about 30%. So it's a wide range, but they're all on the side of there's been an increase in precipitation. Uh, the real use of models is it allows you then to say, okay, so now we have a little bit of consensus. Now we can use this model as basically a virtual laboratory, right? So, so we can go in and we can try to understand well, what aspects of the model, what, what uh, processes are the ones that are contributing to these, these feedbacks that might be leading to these precipitation changes that are maybe larger than we expect. And so I think I always look at models as, as basically virtual laboratories, right? They're experiments. You can go in and you get to, to, to kind of not as tweak isn't the right word, but you can use them to change parameters and try to understand what the impact of that is after after you've kind of already used it in, it, in its formal version to understand maybe if there's been a change or not. Um, but I, I guess I just want to reiterate that these type of counterfactual versus actual forecasts kind of way to look at it from a, a storyline approach is just again one of the ways in which you can try to look at extreme precipitation changes. Um, you can, a lot of people run models for hundreds of years and look at trends and statistics and compare them to, you know, the last 30, 40 years of observations. And so it's a variety of techniques that I've, I've used. Um, and I'll just maybe, in terms of, of you know, I think part of your question was whether we see this trend coming out more so in hurricanes than other precipitation events, for example. Uh, I, I'm not, I think that from a scientific viewpoint, that's unclear at this point. Um, I have a question for the fourth speaker. I forgot your name, sorry. <laughs> um, so you kind of mentioned like this that there are different needs of people who migrate from Puerto Rico to the mainland. Yes. And I was wondering, could like a big like uh, a key theme of this conference that I've heard from different panels is um, going from theory to practice. So I was wondering what you think states could really do to accommodate the needs. That's an excellent question, and that was something that we were considering because it's we find it very fascinating to look at the differences and characteristics, but just looking at it doesn't really do much other than saying like it's neat. We we're very interested in thinking about how that information could be used to inform better policy. So if we know uh, that migrants uh, from the island into the more traditional areas uh, where Puerto Ricans have settled. Uh, so again, like New York, Massachusetts, uh, Pennsylvania, Connecticut. Um, if we know that their socioeconomic characteristics uh, or their, their, their socioeconomic status is considerably lower uh, than in other areas, uh, that is where, uh, let's say, um, social workers could step in to uh, help facilitate. Um, if we think about if these individuals are not moving for the purpose of work, so employment assistance may not be as critical as something like um, perhaps educational access, uh, to go back to school so that people get more skills and have, that will provide them with a better employment opportunities down the road. Um, so part of what we're concerned about is really getting the word out there. And I think that's something I'm very excited about being part of RISE is this idea of having this network where we can connect people who are doing a lot of very di uh, very interesting uh, but different things uh, that when connected can be extremely powerful in terms of best facilitating uh, the needs of people who have been displaced uh, by these disasters. Thank you for the question. All right, I'm just about out of time, um, but I didn't you know if there was anybody wanted to make a closing statement or had any final thoughts that they wanted to share. <laughs> you guys are all great. That's all right.
that's why I kind of I wanted to start part of the Okay, there's been multiple models. I know, I'm here Yeah, and we're going to 